gracious God, once again, we seek thy face. We do so humbly, reverently, conscious, O God, of our need of thy presence. We have read in thy word of the dedication of the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not stand to minister by reason of the glory. And, o God, we need a touch from heaven. We need a sense of the glory of God filling this house today. We can sing the right words we know. We can read the inspired and infallible, precious word of God. Yet, Lord, if thy presence is not granted to us, if we have not that sense of the glory of God, then our meeting will be in vain. Lord, we dread. We dread, O oh God have a vain and empty meeting. We want thee to come down. We want thee to bless us and to touch us. We want thee to revive thy people. We want thee, O oh God, to touch the hearts of those who are cold and backslidden. We want thee to speak to those who are out of Christ with no hope for the future. Lord, surely thou art interested in this meeting. Surely thou dost see our very great need so we pray that thou would satisfy us early with thy mercy, that thy people might rejoice and be glad in thee. We ask thee, Lord, to remember every single person that is found here, every individual that is in this house. Bless each one, we pray of thee. We pray for every family that is represented. We want all our loved ones to taste the sweetness of the gospel, we want them all to walk in God's ways. We want them all to be with us in heaven when we leave this world. And, o God, we pray that thou would lay a burden upon our hearts, that we might not be satisfied until the very last one is gathered in, until all are born again, until all are walking in the King's highway. We ask thee, Lord, to remember this congregation Bless the one who pastors this church and his wife and family. Remember, O oh God, and our brother Boone, and the elder of the congregation and his wife and family. Remember each member. Remember all who teach in the Sunday school and leaders in different aspects of the work. We commit them to thee. We pray thou would give them wisdom, that thou would give them grace, that thou would give them a love for the task. And above all, Thou wilt give them a love for the Saviour, whom they know and whom they seek to serve. We think, Lord, of the need of this nation. Again, we pray Thou wilt bless the President, the Prime Minister, the members of the government, the security services, the emergency services, all who seek to keep the men and women safe and to guide them in the nation. Speak, Lord, to them. Help them to govern by godly laws that are founded in the scriptures of truth. We pray our God that thou would open thine hand wide to bless this nation, that multitudes might be brought into the kingdom of God and taste and see that the Lord is good. What we pray for Singapore, we pray for every other nation, that the fear of God might come down, and that many lost souls, groping in darkness, not able to find their way, might come to the knowledge of the truth and might discover that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's the only Saviour, that he died for sinners, that he triumphed over death and triumphed over sin, and that he's alive today and that he's ever willing to save those who come to him. Lord, spread thy truth across the face of the earth. So now we commend ourselves to thee, confessing our many failures and our many sins, seeking thy mercy, seeking thy forgiveness, praying that thou would bless us as we meditate upon thy truth. Come, O Lord, come and bless us now. Come and defeat the devil. Come and bind the strong man and spoil his goods. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to turn to that portion of God's word that we have been reading from. The book of Ruth, chapter 2, and I read just the first two verses 
as a preparation for what I want to say uh, from this chapter. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field, Three years of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, at the end of chapter 1 uh, of the book of Ruth, we discover that Ruth and Naomi came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That was the first of the two great harvests, the second being the wheat harvest. It began about the middle of the month of March and it continued till uh, the middle or perhaps to the end of the month of May. So you're thinking of a time schedule of approximately two to two and a half months. Uh, when uh, Ruth uh, saw uh, what, what her situation was, realized that there was a need in the home, she made a simple request to her mother-in-law Naomi and she said, let me go, let me leave and ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. She didn't want to be a burden to her mother-in-law. She wanted to go out and she wanted to work. And there's a little indication even here that Ruth had learned something from the Word of God. Because back in Leviticus chapter 19, the gleanings were for the, the poor people and for the stranger. Deuteronomy uh, tells us uh, also that the gleanings were for the widow. So uh, we have three things uh, together there. A poor person could glean. A stranger, someone from another nation could glean. And a widow could glean. Ruth qualified on all three counts. She was poor, Maybe she had been rich in Moab, but now she has been willing to accept poverty in order to follow the Lord and walk in his ways. She's a widow. Her husband, Malam, has died. He was, we indicate, perhaps a sickly young man, and he died not too long after the family had lived, uh, had moved to live in Moab, and uh, she was also a foreigner, she was from another nation, so she qualified on all three counts. And this chapter 2 shows Ruth out leaning in the field. And the first point that I want you to notice is this, she had the right attitude to her work. And I'm going to say that's absolutely crucial. She had the right attitude to work because she was willing to work. She wanted to work. She said, let me do it. Let me go out. Let me glean. She knew it would be hard work, but she wanted to do it. Gleaning is difficult. You're bending over all the time. And I dare say, uh, as you work, you're occasionally rubbing your back. It's sore. Uh, when our children were young, one of the things they did uh, was gather potatoes. Not because we had a farm but because there were lots of farmers around and when the time came for the potatoes to be gathered, there was good money to be had. It wasn't that they wanted uh, to be of great benefit to the community. It's not that they enjoyed going out into the field, but there was good money, good pocket money, far more pocket money than we would ever give them to be had in gathering the potatoes. And they would go out early in the morning their backs would be sore, but they'd keep going. They'd great big boxes to fill. When you filled a certain box, a certain size of box, the farmer paid you a certain amount of money. And at the end of the week, uh, they could have quite a lot of money because of bending over and picking up the potatoes that were dug up uh, by the uh, potato digger. So uh, they, they earned money, but it was hard work. Here is Ruth, and she has a very willing attitude to her work. She says, let me go, let me glean uh, after him. 
uh, in whose eyes I shall find favour. So she's a willing young woman. She is willing to work. That is crucial. Absolutely crucial. Your attitude to what you do is of paramount importance. You could do a lot of work and not please God. A great deal of work. You could work in the Sunday school, you could work in the church, you could work in the community. You could do a lot of work in your secular work and not please God because you do it in the wrong way. Uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verse 12, uh, we are told concerning giving. Uh, it, there's a principle here that applies right across the board. It says, for if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Paul is speaking there of giving to the work of God. He shows us the importance, really, of giving according to our means, and that would mean tithing and giving gifts on top of the tithing. And he says, if there's first a willing mind, it's accepted according to that a man hath, not according to that he hath not. In other words, it's not the amount that is significant. It's the spirit with which you give the money. Christ complimented the poor widow who put just two mites into the offering basket. He knew the spirit with which she gave that money. He knew that her heart was in it. She was in it, you might say, body, mind and soul. She was giving herself to the work of God by giving her two different mites and dropping them into the offering basket. Now just uh, let that spread out across everything that we do in the service of God. The first step is to have a willing mind to want to do it. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a person who puts all his or her heart and soul into the work. When Ruth came to Naomi, she, she might, you know, have an hour later broken her leg and not been able to do the work. She might have had a heart attack and not been able to do the work. But the very fact that she had the right spirit in the sight of God was as good as doing it if she hadn't been able to do it subsequently. God looked down upon that young woman. He saw her willingness to do the work. And that was pleasing in his sight. Now, just having a willingness doesn't excuse you if you are subsequently able to do it and don't do it. But the first step is to be willing to do it. The hymn writer said, I would not with swift winged zeal on the world's errands go, and labour up the heavenly hill with weary feet and slow. And isn't that often how we do the work of God? Something that we want to do that's not connected with the work of God, I with swift wind zeal we do it. We race to it. We say, oh, I want to do this. I'm really excited. And then there's something to do for God, even coming to God's house or bringing the money out of your pocket to give to the work of God and you do it uh, in a, a fashion that indicates your heart isn't in it. We had a preacher in Ulster many years ago. I never heard him preach, but he was quite a character. W.P. Nicholson was called. He saw the Lord moving in revival power. And during his services, he had tremendous gospel campaigns in Ulster in the 1920s. And Thousands, indeed tens of thousands of people professed salvation in those campaigns. And I met many Christians uh, in later years who had been saved in Nicholson's campaigns. And Nicholson used to say in the middle of his meeting, we'd sing a hymn to take away the pain of pardon. It was the offering hymn. And he knew that people didn't like uh, to give generously to the work of God. But the willing mind. That is the first step in pleasing God in his service. But then you'll also find that there was a submission to the will of God. 
She said to Naomi, I want to go and glean in the eyes of the one in whose sight I will find a grace. I want to go into his field. I want to glean there. She's really submitting herself to the will of God. Wherever I find grace, I will glean in the field of that person in whose eyes I find grace. I'm submitting myself, she's really saying, to the will of God. The hymn writer said, My times are in thy hand. My God, I wish them there. My life, my friends, my soul I leave entirely to thy care. Ruth was committing herself to the will of God, submitting herself. That wasn't easy. Remember, she's lost so much. She's come back poor. She has come back. She's a foreigner now in a strange land. Nothing of the glory of the past clings to her. Nothing of the splendor of Moab. Nothing of the riches of Moab. And yet she's not grumbling. She's not complaining. She's submissive to the will of God. And I'm saying to you, that is a good attitude to have. Whatever happens to you, whether good or ill, whether the wind blows favorably or unfavorably, whether the sun shines upon you or you feel the chill of an icy blast, you should be able to say, it is the Lord. It is his will for me at this time in my life. And I will submit myself to the will of God. It's so important to surrender to God, to give yourself to God and to say, I will do thy will, O Lord, rather than my own will. And then you'll notice her deep humility. Here is a very gracious and a very humble young woman. After she had been gleaning in the field for some time, Boaz came into the field and he noticed her. And he said, whose damsel is this? Who is that young woman that I see there in the field? And that speaks very highly of Boaz. He had a personal interest in all his workers. And he knew who was in his field. They weren't strangers to him. They were like friends to Boaz because Boaz was a most godly man and shortly I'll show you that he was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had an interest in every person in his field. He said, whose damsel is this? Who is that young woman? And then uh, when it was told him, uh, he spoke to her and he said to her, here is thou not my daughter, verse 8, go not to clean in another feet, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my neighbors. And he told her some more information, verse 9, and verse 10 says, Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And she went down to verse 13, after Boaz had spoken more kindly words to her, she said, Let me find favour in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. She, she's overwhelmed by the kindness of Boaz. But well, why have you taken knowledge of me, saying I am a stranger? You're the owner of this field, you're a great man. Why are you showing an interest in a poor foreigner? Why are you allowing me these privileges, treating me like one of your handmaidens, though I'm not like your handmaidens? She's really saying, I'm not even as high up as they are. She feels herself to be the lowest of the low. And it's not mock humility, it is real humility on Ruth's part. She feels that she's a nobody. She feels that she's nothing. Nothing in the sight of Boaz. 
and we might say less than nothing in the sight of God. That is real humility. And you know, one of the greatest problems that we have as individuals, and one of the greatest problems that the Church of Jesus Christ has today is a lack of humility. It is pride. Men and women are proud. You and I are proud by nature. We don't like to be rubbed the wrong way. We don't like anybody to upset us or say anything nasty about us. Even uh, if it's true, we don't like it. We get our hackles up, as we say. We get angry. Uh, we flare up. We fly into a temper. And our great problem, one of our greatest, is a lack of true humility. Here is a young woman, and you can see the progress in her spiritual life because she's truly humble in the sight of God. She says, well, why? why do you notice me? I'm not worth noticing, is what she's really saying to Boaz. So, so let me just recap on, on three points connected with her attitude, her willingness to work. Her willingness to submit to the will of God and her deep humility. I, I mentioned another point that isn't actually uh, in the chapter as such, uh, that you couldn't put your finger on the verse and say, well, that's a proof, but it's her sweetness. It, it's an impression you get, in a sense, reading between the lines. I'm sure you've read things, maybe a letter or maybe some report and you've, you've read between the lines. I know the children might find this strange when it's first mentioned to them, reading between the lines they look and they say there's nothing between the lines. But there is. Quite often there is. Nothing uh, down in black and white but there's something between the lines. Uh, you, you detect maybe some nuance there you think there's something here that they're trying to say to me. They're not very happy. The tone of that letter, even though it's very carefully phrased and very correct, and I was almost going to say politically correct, yet there's something that, that, that strikes you. And uh, you can detect either happiness or you can detect unease as, as you read between the lines. And as I read between the lines, in the second chapter of Ruth, there is something that comes to me. And that is the sweetness of Ruth's surrender and her disposition. She's a sweet girl. And she's sweet in her relationship with Boaz. She's sweet in her relationship with Naomi. She's sweet in the way that she interacts, I believe, with the others who are reaping in the fields. And that's the sort of fragrance that you and I need to have in our lives. There should be a sweetness about our lives. We shouldn't repel people. We should attract people. We should draw people. You know, there are certain people and they come into a room and they have an aura about them. There are godly people and they have a godly aura about them. They are attractive people. There is something about them. There is a sweetness. Even about rugged people, there may be a sweetness because their hearts are filled with a tender love. Nobody is sweeter than the Lord Jesus Christ. What sweetness there is in him. It's no wonder that in the Psalm of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 16, we read these words, Yea, He is altogether lovely. Jesus Christ, the altogether lovely one, there is a sweetness in His character. Now I know some people by nature are very gruff. You don't want to approach them. 
But there is really no excuse for gruffness. You might say, well, I find it hard to, to be sweet. Well, if you find it hard, there's a great exercise for you. There's a great work. That could be a great accomplishment in your life. If you could overcome that gruffness, that grumpiness, and become a sweet person, someone who's a welcoming person, someone who has a kindly disposition. Yes, it's battling against yourself. I know. And we all have to do it. But don't we want to have that sweetness that is found in Ruth's character? Here is a young woman, and as I look at her attitude, I see that she's willing to work. She's totally submissive to the will of God. She's devoid of pride almost, and I'm sure there must be some places. She's a very humble young woman. She's a sweet young woman. But then along with that, there is a steely determination. She says, let me go now to the field and clean ears of corn. After him in whose sight I shall find grace. I want to do it, she's saying. I want to do it. And she's really saying, I am determined to do it. Please, give me your permission to go and do it. And you will never, ever get anywhere without a resolute character, without determination. It was said of Reuben, the oldest son of Jacob, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. There's no backbone in water. Reuben had no backbone. And he didn't excel. He failed. Where there's a lack of determination, there will be no success in the work of God. Ruth was a very determined Young woman, I want to go, I want to clean. It may be hard work, but I want to do it. Don't uh, stop me from doing it. Please let me go. Please give me your permission to go and clean ears of corn in the field of the man that I will find favour with. Let me go. Let me do it. It's determined. Our great wartime Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, promised the people blood and toil and sweat and tears and after more than half a century you can listen to recordings of Winston Churchill's voice and you will be inspired uh, he spoke such inspiring oratory he stirred a nation he put back bone into a nation that would have been ready to quit under his predecessor, Neville Chamberlain. And he had, uh, in a natural sense, that determination. Uh, back in Genesis 32, you have that spiritual determination in Jacob. Uh, when the angel said, let me go for the day breaketh, Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. No, no, please, I'm not going to let you go. You must, you must bless me. Determination, backbone, not being as slippery as an eel, not being unstable as water like Reuben. Here is the character of this young woman. Here we see the right attitude in this young woman. She wants to do it, and by the grace of God, she will do it. Now, the second thing I want to say, you think, well, this is. Uh, only the second point, but the second thing I want to say is that with the right attitude, Ruth found herself in the right place. You get to verse 3, and it says, And she went and came and cleaned uh, in the field uh, after the reapers, uh, and her hat was to light uh, on a part of the field belonging unto the road. Her hat, that word hat, uh, the you, you may know the length and form of it. Happened. Something happened. Or a happening. Uh, a hap uh, is something that, that isn't premeditated. She just went out, we might say, at random. And going out at random, 
And I believe looking to the Lord for direction, she just went into a field that she was permitted to go into. She didn't say, oh look, that's a great field. There's, uh, there's a tremendous crop of barley in that field. Surely I'd have rich pickings there. Or she didn't think, who's the richest man in the area? Who has the best fields in the area? I'll go there and I will clean there and I'm sure to bring back a, a great store of supply. She didn't think that way. She said, I'll just go and if somebody is willing to give me permission to go and clean in his field, that's the field I will go into. And her hap, her hap, her, I was going to use the word luck, but you would slay me for using a word like that. But let me tell you that in a very old translation of the Bible, uh, and I, I think uh, it, it, it's ten nails, but I may be wrong, uh, it speaks of Joseph, and it says, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a lucky fellow. Uh, so I remember over in England, a man showing that to me in an old Bible that he had. He was a lucky fellow. Well, we don't believe in luck. But this young woman, she didn't premeditate the feat that she was to go into. She didn't say, well, look, that's the feat I'll go into. She didn't consult with her mother-in-law as to what field she should go to clean in. She just went to the first field where she was permitted to, to gather. Now that's one side of the coin. Let, let me reverse it and, and let me give you the other side. I don't believe it was chance. I don't believe it was luck. What I believe is, from her point of view, it wasn't premeditated. It wasn't planned what field she would go into. But there's a higher power in this world and there's a guiding hand in this world when you have the right attitude and you submit yourself to God and you're wholehearted and, and willing to do his will you will find yourself being directed to the right place you may remember in Genesis chapter 24 Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac and Abraham's servant prayed, and he, he went on the errand. He didn't know what the final result would be, but God opened up the way for him to find the right person, Rebecca. And he was able to say, I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. I, I was doing the right thing, and because I was doing the right thing after praying, God led me unerringly. God led me infallibly to the right place. You want to know where the will of God is for your life? What you should be doing with your life? You start with your attitude. You start with having the right attitude. That attitude of willingness to work. That attitude of submission to the will of God. That utter humility that ought to characterize each one of us. That sweet willingness, that sweetness of character as we conquer uh, the, the old nature. And that determination to do what God wants me to do. When you have that attitude, God will lead you infallibly. God will lead you unerringly on. And here is this young woman. The place is chosen for her. And let me tell you something about that place. It was a safe place. A safe place. You'll find that an instruction was given to the young men, verse 9. Uh, Boaz says, Let thy eyes be on the feet that they do reap. Go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? A young woman was very vulnerable in the fields. Very vulnerable. And if she had been in somebody else's fields, she could very easily have been assaulted. And all her dignity and honor taken away. 
utterly humiliated and abused. She could have been in somebody else's seat. But Boaz says to her, and she's found the right place, Boaz says to her, I've commanded the young men not to touch you. They will not lay one finger on you. You will be safe. You will be safe in my field. You abide fast by my maid. You stay close to them. Don't, don't go away from here. And don't go away from my fields. You stay here. It's a safe place. And the will of God is safe. There's danger outside the will of God. You go do your own thing. And you can end up a wreck. Ruined your life a shipwreck. You can destroy yourself. You can destroy your testimony. You can even destroy your family by stepping outside the will of God. The safest place, the only safe place, is inside the will of God. You stay here, Boaz says. I've commanded the young men, they will not lay one finger on you. You'll be perfectly safe here. But then also, it was the place where the best food was found. And uh, I haven't time to, to elaborate too much on that, but you'll notice that at meal time, he reached her parched corn. Now back in Joshua chapter 5, one of the first things that the Israelites tasted when they entered Canaan was parched corn. It's one of the food, uh, foods of Canaan, parched corn. So she got the best of food when she was inside the well of God. She also got the best water because she was told, you drink of the water the young men have drawn. Back in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, you find David and he's sighing uh, over uh, his longing. Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem. Here it is. Here's Bethlehem. And she's able to drink water from Bethlehem. The best water in the land, the, the foodstuff of Canaan, the place that God selected for his people is reached to her. And she's in the best company because at meantime she's beside Boaz. And uh, perhaps next week I'll, I'll do more of this, but Boaz is a picture of Jesus Christ. His name means, in him is strength. He's called a mighty man of wealth or valor. And you see his kindly disposition towards his workers. And he's a kinsman of Naomi's. And he has the right to redeem. He's a kinsman redeemer as Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. We say bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, able to redeem us able to save us from our sins. She's in the best place. It's a safe place. It's a place where she gets the best nourishment and the finest water in the land. What do we receive? Inside the will of God, we find the finest nourishment for our souls. We find it in the scriptures of truth. Job said he esteemed the words of God's mouth more than his necessary food. There's nothing sweeter, nothing more nourishing to your soul than the word of God. And then we think of the water of life as we drink from the blessing of God at the throne of grace. How we are refreshed in prayer. Have you ever spent time in prayer when you went to the throne of grace, downcast, defeated, dejected, in despair? And as it were, the Lord revived you. And he lifted you up and you left that place of prayer after spending some time there. And my, you were floating on air almost. You were triumphant. You were rejoicing. You were transformed. Just like someone that had been gasping for thirst and had received that refreshing water from the well of Bethlehem. The best place inside the will of God. You're nourished there. You're refreshed there. And you're the best company there. Because 
You're in the company of the Lord of glory. You're in the company of one who loves you. In the company of one who died for you. In the company of one who will be waiting to receive you if you're saved. When you leave this world and step over from time into eternity. What a thrill that will be. And the hymn writer said, I don't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died for my sins to atone. When the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. I don't have to cross Jordan alone. And when you're in the will of God, in the center of God's will, you're in the best possible place. You're safe there. You're refreshed there. You're fed there on the finest of the things of God that will satisfy your soul. And you have the presence of of your Redeemer, your kinsman Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the next point I want to make is that when this young woman, Ruth, with the right attitude, was in the right place, she set about the work. I won't refer you to the verses, you can look them up. She worked. She worked. <coughs> there is this idea, and I may have mentioned it at different times, that some people Believing in sinless perfection and uh, driving forward a holiness agenda, uh, uh, think about, and they talk about letting go and letting God. As if, you know, uh, our Christian life were like getting into an aeroplane and you just hand everything over to the pipe and you just lie back and relax. And uh, find a comfortable place on the plane, walk about the plane, it's all nice, it's all easy. Pilot's doing all the work. You don't need to do anything. The stewardess will come around. They'll offer you food and they uh, offer you other things. And you can relax. And the Christian life, they think, is, is just like that. It's not. The Bible speaks about enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And a hymn writer put it this way. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? In a hard time. Are we going to have an easy time? Do you just let go and let go? You lie back and, and everything's done for you? That is not the way. Revelation 14 and verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Yea, saith the Spirit from henceforth, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. They rest from their labors. That word labors uh, is from a Greek word that means cutting down. You think of cutting down a tree, branch by branch, until you chop it down to the very roots. You're working at it, you're cutting it down, cutting it down. Well, that's the sort of word that's found in connection with our labors in Revelation 14 and verse 13. When you're serving God, in a way you're, you're cutting down your strength, little by little. As you give yourself to the Lord, you wear yourself out that little bit more. You say, well, that's not fair. I want to enjoy my life. You will enjoy it. But in a different sort of way. But you, you'll enjoy far more. When all the work's over, and you've been cut as it were right down, and there's no strength left, you'll enjoy contemplating, drawing your last breath, and entering glory to look on the face of your Saviour. You say, my, uh, my toils are over now. I've given everything. I've nothing more to give, Lord. I'm ready now to go home to be with thee, to uh, be in that place where there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. I want to be there, Lord. I'm ready to go there. Hard work. Hard work. Battling against sin. Battling against the devil. Seeking the power of the Spirit of God to overcome. Do you know that D.L. Moody, the great American evangelist, said he never knew a lazy person to be saved. Well, he didn't live uh, uh, in our generation, uh, because I think I've met plenty of lazy people, uh, and, uh, I believe many of them are saved. Uh, not saying everybody's lazy, please don't get me wrong, but uh, 
God expects his people to work for him, to work with that right attitude in the right place. The best Christians have been hard workers. I think of Spurgeon, I think of John Calvin, and then I think of a man that I mentioned uh, on Wednesday night as I was closing in prayer, Dr. John Sum. John Sum was a mighty, mighty man of God. And he would preach uh, for three hours, for two hours, and then he would have inquiry meetings lasting a long time. And, and he would deal with sin in a very severe way. Uh, and he would specify sin. Now you put your hand up, he would say, if you've committed any of those sins and you intend to repent, and if you've stolen money, you're going to pay it back. If you've offended somebody, you're going to write, you're going to apologize. If you've been immoral, you're going to sort that out. And, and, and he, he made them put up their hands and, and, and he had very close dealings with them all. And after preaching for two hours and dealing with inquirers uh, for maybe another hour or more, he would go home drenched in sweat. And he would take his clothing and uh, they would all be washed and he would put on a fresh set of clothes and he would go out and he would preach a second time, go through the whole work again. And again, he would be drenched in sweat, and he'd have to change his clothes, and then he would go out and preach a third time. Three times a day, he was drenched in sweat. He took everything out of himself. He did die a young man. He died a man that professedly led over a hundred thousand people to Jesus Christ. And when he came to Singapore in 1935, there was such a move of the Spirit of God that 1935 has been called by Christians uh, in this nation the Singapore Pentecost. You labor for God. You work for Him. And inside the will of God, I'm almost through. Inside the will of God, in the right place, with the right attitude, you will achieve far more than you could ever imagine. You see, it worked out very well for Ruth, surprisingly well. Uh, and uh, she came home and uh, we discovered that after she had gleaned in the field and had sufficed the first 17, she got all that she wanted, and it says, it was about an ephah of barley. Uh, I, I'm hopeless at working out uh, these weights and measures and, and what it means. But I remember reading that what she had uh, after she had eaten herself was enough to feed two people for five days. So you work that out. Two and a half months of harvest. If she had a similar return every day, she had enough to feed herself and her mother-in-law for an entire year. And that's beside anything else that she would do. In two to two and a half months, according to those calculations, she would have had, had enough food to feed herself and her mother-in-law for 12 months, for an entire year. Of course, there was a reason. One reason was because she worked so hard. But another reason was because she found generosity. For in verse 15, it says, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. She got little bonuses. We all love little bonuses. You work, and the boss comes and says, You've done very well this month. There's a bonus for you. It doesn't happen so much nowadays, I fear. But always nice to get a bonus, to get a little surprise. And you can think of Ruth there. She's in the fields. She's like, oh, yeah, there's a big, big clump. And she says, that's, that's more than cleaners. And she wonders, should I pick that up? And she gets a nod uh, from uh, the, the reapers. Yes, yes, you take that. It's lying there. It's, uh, you have as much right to it as anybody else you take it. So she does very, very well. She's being looked after very, very well. And isn't that the way that, that
the Lord deals with his people, doesn't he constantly give us little bonuses? Times when he draws near and warms our hearts. Times when he blesses us in unexpected ways. But of course, what I may call these little treats, and these great treats as they sometimes are, they are for the people of God. They are for the wholehearted people of God working inside the will of God. God cares for his people. God loves to treat his people. He loves to bless them. Sometimes you're reading the scriptures and you get such a blessing. Sometimes you're praying and you get such a blessing. Sometimes in preaching the word, teaching the word, witnessing, you get a great blessing. Sometimes you get a tremendous answer to your prayer. And you say, that was way beyond what I ever imagined. That's the Lord's handful of purpose. He's handing it down to you to encourage you. He's handing it down to you to show his love for you. To show how much he cares for you. To show you what he has in store for you when this life is over. The joy that you will enter into. The peace, the bliss. How good is the God we adore. Our faithful unchangeable friend whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. God is good. I say it without a shadow of doubt. God is good. And Ruth received handfuls of purpose. The food was left there, or at least at the, at the corn was left there deliberately to encourage her to give her more, you'll find that many of God's faithful servants have reaped a harvest way in excess of anything they ever have expected. I've mentioned W.P. Nicholson, an Ulster preacher. He was an eccentric. He was a character. But he had a burden for souls. When he was preaching on a gospel mission in England one time, he would rise at 6 o'clock in the morning in order to seek God. And very often he didn't appear till after midday. His breakfast would be left outside his door, it would be untouched. And on one occasion he was in such an in such an agony praying for souls that, that he wrestled with the bed sheets and he actually told them. Didn't know he was doing it. But he was in agony. Though he was a strange character in the pulpit, God used him and multitudes were saved. He got handfuls of purpose. John's son got handfuls of purpose. C.H. Spurgeon got handfuls of purpose. Uh, many lady missionaries have received handfuls of purpose. Many of the ordinary people of God who haven't been great in the eyes of the world have received handfuls of purpose. And you and I can receive those handfuls of purpose. It all starts with having the right attitude. Romans 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What if you're not saved? What if you've never turned from your sin? receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. What if you've never asked him to save you? Well, here is the time. Here is the opportunity. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Christ himself said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Come, O come. Come and taste and sing of the Lord is good. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we ask thee to apply thy truth to all of our hearts. Lord, help us to be thy truth. We thank you for this godly young woman. Thank you, Lord, that she was a rapid learner, that she went forward quickly, and she served thee with her whole heart. And she bears an honoured name and has an honoured place in the word of God. May we seek by thy grace 
to follow in her steps. For Christ our Savior's sake. Amen.